understand who the fuck I am on this U.S. land. I let my hair grow, then I cut it off. Put a couple lines in it, cause you know I'm never coming soft. I do a lot of shows and I get a lot of stares. I got a lot of haters, but really who cares? Well, I'm just going to press record and I'm just going to go for it, guys. Welcome to Mitch Please, episode 8. Uh, thank you again to Rachel Miles and Ginger Daniels for last week, for episode 7, for the con- contrib- contributions. There's the word. For that episode, that was a great one. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate everyone that's listening here on YouTube.com slash The Mitch Valentine. We are looking for another source, another outlet, another uh, audio host site uh, to post these episodes. I had a little issues with some issues with SoundCloud. Um, there, there are a couple episodes over on SoundCloud, and there will be a co- all of the episodes on a new uh, audio site. Maybe a few of them here, guys. Just bear with me. I know it's tough because on YouTube, <clears throat> excuse me, on YouTube, you can only listen uh, with your phone open, or you know, of course, on a laptop is the best method for uh, for YouTube videos. I understand you can't close your phone down, put your headphones on and get a workout and listen to this show. So trust me, I'm aware and I'm working on it. Um, maybe perhaps, uh, perhaps very soon you will be hearing all episodes of Mitch Please on another audio host site. But in the meantime, thank you very much for going to youtube.com slash the Mitch Valentine and, and uh, giving us a listen here, giving us a play, giving us a view and giving us a like on uh, facebook.com slash Mitch Please Podcast. Oh yeah, we got an official uh, URL, official web address on Facebook. I finally figured it out. It only took me, uh, oh, you know, six or seven years of being on Facebook to figure out how to actually make a customized uh, web address, URL as the kids say. So that's happening, guys. A lot of stuff's happening. I went and saw Central Intelligence on Tuesday uh, with Mike Shoup, of course, and... uh, it was hilarious. I was actually blown away. I didn't really know what to expect. I knew The Rock and you know Kevin Hart are just hilarious guys and and great actors, really. And um, you know, I, I, we started watching them. I'm not going to give any spoilers on this one, guys, but I will say that you know the storyline is a little cheesy, but the uh, the performances and the overall uh, message is fantastic. Um, and to further elaborate, I, I thought The Rock actually stole the show comedically from Kevin Hart even. I mean, K- Kevin Hart's one of the greatest comedians in the world, but I mean, The Rock really stole the show from, from him. And uh, I, it was laugh out loud funny. It was probably the funniest thing I've ever seen The Rock do since, uh, I don't know, the old rock concert in Sacramento. <laughs> so that was great. <clears throat> did a little comedy this week. Uh, you know, it's it's tough, guys, when you get up on that mic and you know I've only done it about thirty or maybe forty times, and it's it's, it's tough. But uh, I'm gonna keep pushing that. I'm gonna keep uh, trying to get better and and trying to uh, set up some writing sessions and learn from some people that are really good at it. That's my thing. You know, when I do something, <clears throat> whoo, throat's a little. Uh, yeah, throat's, uh, throat's been through some wars, it seems like. Oh, that sounded good. Uh, but no, seriously, like uh, on this uh, on this comedy kick here, I mean, uh, I want to start really taking it uh, a little more serious and really start cracking down on my writing, start going on the road with people, checking out other shows, um, because I want to be better at it. Uh, it's very difficult for me. Um, but you know what? If it's not hard... It, and it's not difficult, then it's probably not worth doing, you know, so we had that going on, I tried to watch, uh, as I record this, last night there was three wrestling shows, there was an East Bay Pro Wrestling show, which I've never been to, I don't think I've really even watched any of their stuff, Uh, there was also a Reno Wrestle Factory show, which, uh, nothing but love for those uh, Reno Wrestle Factory guys, I've had a lot of fun over there, I know the Chico Hammers uh, were wrestling there last night, and then also Gold Rush uh, was running a uh, a Lady Luck uh, event, and uh, I wanted to check that out on the live stream, but unfortunately uh, the live stream wasn't working properly. I wanted to 
uh, review that a little bit. Um, in the future, I will definitely, especially if there's a live stream or if I'm able to be there live in person, I want to start uh, reviewing some of these local wrestling shows, man. Some of these NorCal uh, great wrestling events. I know Marcus Mack and All Pro Wrestling is throwing together some great cards over there. I'd love to go check that out. Again, Gold Rush Pro Wrestling, Sparky Ballard, they're, they're, they always have a great show. The Reno Wrestle Factory always has a great show. And, um, you know, of course, Pro Championship Wrestling is my uh, is my home promotion and a, a promotion that I miss. To be honest, to be frank, I mean, I really uh, I miss being a part of uh, of of Pro Championship Wrestling. I'm starting to really miss uh, getting in the ring and 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 bumping around and moving around and uh, and and wrestling. Um, this is it's been a tough uh, seven seven eight months here i've uh, i've missed it the whole time but it's like i know what i'm doing is the best for my body my body's taking a beating just like everybody else in this wrestling business you know our bodies take a thrashing so m myself in particular you know i've got two separated shoulders and um the right one is significantly worse than the left and um, it's been a struggle. Um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna get surgery, guys. Uh, might as well, might as well get this out here. I, I might be getting surgery. Uh, I might not. I I'm really hoping that this shoulder is gonna heal on its own. It's been seven, eight months though, so it's not looking too good that it's gonna heal on its own. But I am back in the gym. I just got a, a gym membership back after a, a long hiatus, a long break from working out, and. Uh, I'm uh I'm hitting the weights. I'm hitting the uh I'm hitting the pool. I'm hitting the hot tub. I'm uh I'm hitting the uh f the tires, man. Today I'm about to go flip some tires and I'm gonna hit some yoga and I'm just gonna start uh start putting my body through some things that it needs to get uh through. It needs to be uh more active. I, I do ride my bike all over the place, so I'm staying active. I'm staying in shape here. Uh it's just nutritionally has always been a struggle. I have packed on some weight uh, since I stopped wrestling and that's all on me. You know, that's that's my nutrition. Um that I just feel like, oh, you know, I should be able to eat whatever I want, you know, and just do whatever I want, and that's just kind of my lifestyle. But uh, I know that if I want to get in that slim and that tip-top shape, uh, I'm going to have to clean it up. I'm going to have to cook that damn chicken up. I'm going to have to cook those rice and veggies up, and I'm going to have to throw them in some Tupperware, and I'm going to have to do that because, you know, a healthy lifestyle and a healthy body is is what I do want, ultimately. So... That's what we got going on over here. Uh, nothing uh, too spectacular. Uh, I'm excited for this episode. Uh, this week we have Drake Nelson, and uh, going back a few weeks, you know, me and Drake, uh, we had a great time over there at Gold Country Casino. Drake did a show uh, with Huck Flynn, and then uh, we went up over to his uh, to his hotel room at the Gold Country Casino. We sat down, we recorded an interview, and then. We went out and uh, had some had a few drinks and just kind of caught up and and hung out and uh, it was a great time. I love Drake Nelson. He's been a guy that I've really uh, just had a friendship with outside of the wrestling business but of course the wrestling business is what brought us together and there's really only a handful of guys in the wrestling business I can say man I really love this person and this person is a great person and this person understands me and uh, and uh, I appreciate him and I really appreciate Drake and I really admire Drake uh, for what he's been doing uh, especially these last couple years he's really going after that stand-up comedy and you're gonna hear his story guys so uh, without any further ado let's cut over there right now drake nelson let's do it so we're sitting back in a luxury suite here at the gold country casino in oroville california getting ready to take a picture of this man naked in a bathtub with a rubber ducky ladies and gentlemen my guest this week on mitch please my good friend my buddy my pal former professional wrestler current stand-up comedian the man the myth Drake Nelson, welcome oh, to the show. Thanks for that intro, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, we go back a long ways, don't we, Mitch? We go back to, uh, man, 2007 is the first time I remember meeting you, man, at the Orville Municipal Auditorium. You rolled in there with Tom Bocci with cameras, and yeah. I was like, what's going on here, man? This is it was a, it was a production, man. Because what you did with Tom Bocci in the territory is you took NorCal Wrestling and you turned it into an actual, real, incredible television show, weekly television show. And I want to talk about that, Drake, because like I said, that's how I met you, man. I mean, I want to talk about a lot, actually, man. But uh, what uh, what inspired you at an early age? Well, a lot of things, man. Like uh, 
I was inspired by the wrestling business as well as stand-up comedy. But uh, stand-up was always like dream number four of shit that I wanted to try, right? So uh, my inspiration for wrestling goes back to like WrestleMania 3. You know what I mean? When Of course. Uh, who's the blonde guy? Hulkster. Oh, that the guy. The Hulkster, whatever his name was. <laughs> and he slammed the big fat guy. Andre the Giant, yeah, that was a pivotal uh, moment for me. So <clears throat> I was a fan of wrestling. Uh, and then when the internet got popular in the mid-90s, like, it really opened my mind up to wrestling because, like, you could read those, like, message boards and stuff. And I was a huge, like, NWO fan. So I got to read, like, all the backstage stuff. Oh, Scott Hall did this, and he said this about Nash, and Nash is pissed, and... Juventud Guerrera just OD'd in Australia. You know what I mean? Like they, I can't remember what they were officially called. Dirt sheets, I think. Yeah, I was the same way, man. About a year mm -hmm. into watching, I started discovering the WrestleZones.coms and the yeah. NoDQ.coms and all these places and learning the insides. And I was like, man, this is a lifestyle for these guys. This doesn't just stop when you know Raw ends or SmackDown right. ends. I mean, this thing is uh, this is deep. This is their lives. And um, who are some of your favorite wrestlers? Um, you know, growing up. Growing up, uh, like Demolition, <laughs> Axe and Smash, they were great. Um, a lot of the baby faces, the Ultimate Warriors, the Hulk Hogan's, uh, Texas Tornado, you know, um, uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, you know, I have a lot of favorites. When I read Mick Foley's book, though, in like 97, 98, whenever that came out, uh, it really kind of made me think like well, maybe I could wrestle you know what I mean so then I started learning about like wrestling schools and stuff and of course saw beyond the mat which we all saw when we were young and um, you know saw how they were training and what they would go through to get into the business and then uh, yeah it kind of motivated me to you know I was very athletic when I was a kid football baseball basketball all that stuff you know you wouldn't look at you know that to look at me now because I'm fat and out of shape. Still good looking, but fat and out of shape. But uh, I didn't get a scholarship anywhere, so I was like 19 and still athletic, you know, so I decided to go to wrestling school. So uh, at first, I went to L.A. Right, right off the bat, and I got that job that, that you heard me talk about on stage tonight where I was doing security for, like, movie premieres and stuff. And I was um, trying to hook up with... Uh, some old school guy, I want to say his name was like Vern Langdon or something. Old school shooter. And then that didn't really uh, go into anything. And then H How old were you, Drake? Sorry to cut you off. This I'm was your first, well, this was your first uh, passion. This was your first dream. Yeah. You want to be a pro wrestler. So right. were you 18? You sign, You go to L.A.? I mean. I was 20. So I'm 36 now. So that was about year 2000, something like that. So I hooked up with XPW. Remember XPW? Absolutely. Extreme Pro Wrestling. They were like the ECW of the West Coast. And uh, uh, I was about to give them like 500 bucks and start training. And um, my parents started having some financial issues at that time. So I moved up here to where we're at today is Orville. You know, and uh, that's how I hooked up with uh, Zach Reeb and uh, pro championship wrestling and i was trained by a uh, schizo mafioso who was a maniac you know what i mean so during this time uh i was totally focused on being a professional wrestler so i'm reading as many books as i can uh i'm online there was a point like i was so serious about the wrestling business like i had this knowledge that no one gave a shit about right like I, I, there was a time where I could rattle off every world champion from, like, 1905 to, like, when Hogan lost the belt to fucking uh, Andre, like, right in that time. I got to tell you, you man, know because, I mean? yeah, no, because what you're saying, it just, uh, it hits me hard because it, it actually, it, it just, it angers me, man. I'm getting upset. I'm standing <laughs> up because here's the problem. These kids nowadays, in my experience, a lot of these students that sign up to wrestling school, they, you know, they show up, 
they train, they do a show, they go, they don't live the business, they don't breathe it, man, they don't have a, a passion for it, maybe some do, some do, uh, just a lot of guys I've seen, they, they don't study up, man, they don't know their history in wrestling, right. you know, they started watching in the late 2000s, and that's all they know, and it's like, hey man, I didn't start watching until 2000, but I studied the 90s and the 80s and the mm-hmm. 70s, I learned, I love professional wrestling, I haven't wrestled a match in almost a year, but I still love it, man, I watch it constantly, so you were watching a lot of wrestling, not just what was on TV, I mean, you were going everywhere, watching Watching all kinds of different yeah. wrestling, right? I was watching stuff from Japan, Mexico, you know, obviously the big three in the 90s was WWF, WCW, ECW. Then I was watching shit like uh, Juggalo Championship Wrestling, you know what I mean? Stuff from uh, Ohio Valley and uh, Mid-South and uh, Chicago was doing a lot of things. APW, of course. Uh, stuff from Canada. Like, I was really into the business. You know, I was really studying it. Like, I read Dynamite Kid's book and Bret Hart's and Harley Race, Terry Funk, uh, Mick Foley, of course, both his books. Like, there was a time where uh, I could honestly say, like, information-wise, like, I knew way more than anybody. You know what I mean? Which, you know, now I have a bunch of, like, Jeopardy wrestling questions in my head that I'll <laughs> never use. All right. I hear you. I'm the same way, man. Again, with the books. I will. I hate to read. I still hate to read, but I'll read a wrestling yeah. autobiography. It's the only thing I'd wanted to read, you know, growing up. And um, But going back to what you said, man, training was schizo. Yeah. I started training two weeks after he unfortunately got locked up and sent away. What was it like training with Schizo? That's a good question, man. little background on, on Schizo. Uh, real name, Anthony Antonucci. I think he's from Sacramento. Uh, his lineage goes back. Um, ah, I can't remember his trainer. Paul DeMarco. Paul DeMarco. Now, Paul DeMarco was trained by Lou Fez. Yes. You know what I mean? So there's a lineage there. And I believe the style of wrestling was called 80s European. You know what I mean? A lot of inside baseball wrestling terminology. Well, what style you trained in? You know what I mean? And we would say 80s European. So everybody would say, okay, you kind of get an idea. So I never heard that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, very, uh, I don't know. The West Coast is is changed a little bit as far as like what 80s European means now but anyway um schizo was a tremendous trainer you know he really took the time and worked on fundamentals and when he was inside that ring like I'd never seen anybody with like such good psychology and it didn't matter uh if you were a big guy little guy fast whatever like he could help you develop you know, from the ground up, you know, when he saw a kid like me that was big, athletic, and a hard worker, and was very encouraging, you know what I mean, because I kept showing up, and I, and once he figured out that I was dedicated, and I wasn't going anywhere, uh, he was a friend, you know what I mean, but he kicked the fuck out of me, you know, and he came from that old school mentality of, uh, you have to appreciate this business, and that was instilled in him. And everybody that was in that class became like a badass professional wrestler. Zach, uh, uh, the original legend, T.O.L. Scotty Boot, Rick Luxury, um, uh, the Suburban Commandos came through that at one time. And um, yeah, Schizo was was awesome, man. We would spend a lot of time talking on the phone just about psychology. You know what I mean? But he had his demons. He definitely had, like, some psychological stuff going on, you know. Um, At that point, I can't remember what was going on in his personal life, but he was very... If if It was almost like if he wasn't talking about wrestling, he was a little bit crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. And Zach Reed will back that up. Like, (laughs) he was was pretty fucking wild, man. Well, Schizo had a saying, I know, you know... uh, Life is fake. Wrestling is real. Another guy, too, I remember hearing this story. Uh, maybe you can fill in the blanks here. Uh, you brought Bradley Rotten with you yeah, to Pro yeah. Championship Wrestling. Is that right? Yeah, I met Bradley Rotten. Uh, there was a like a small period right before I was uh, got established in L.A. where I just hit, I just wanted to make it. So How I got to L.A. is I just went on a Greyhound bus with a couple duffel bags, and I just got dropped off in Hollywood at 3 in the morning and just said, screw it, I'm going to make it. You know what I mean? I think you have to do that. You have to have that drive, and you have to have that mentality. So I wound up in this, like, ritzy homeless shelter in Los Angeles, and it was only for people between the ages of 18 to 20, right? And Brad was living there. 
And once they figured out, oh, this guy came to Hollywood to be a professional wrestler, he should talk to Brad, you know. And uh, we, we became friends, and he was just as knowledgeable, if not more, than I was. You know, he was more into those 80s and 90s wrestling magazines. Yeah. So more current events where my expertise was all over the place. Like, I would have these weird facts from, you know, the early 1900s and how... <laughs> Uh, wrestling was a legitimate sport and how it grew into the carny stuff and but anyway I got along really well with with Brad and uh, I, I was dating his sister for a long time you know what I mean so that's how close we go and Bradley Rotten is a guy I mean he's a he's a current wrestling manager he's been doing that for a yeah. long time he's a great commentator he's also a great musician and Bradley Rotten is blind in one eye he's diabetic and people judge him when they see him. They, yeah. they look at Bradley Rotten and they think, oh, you know. And, and I'll tell you right now, Bradley Rotten, Bradley Justin Finney is one of the most awesome guys I've ever met in my life. One of the most talented guys and yeah. one of the smartest guys, too. Yeah, he's got a great mind for the business and was a guy that would watch tapes after tapes after tapes. You know, old school VCR you know, and oh, he I, still has them. Oh yeah, and they're in great condition, and he can tell you every match, who went over, who didn't, and what was going on with the feud. You know, he's got like 1992 Super Brawls from WCW and stuff. Like, okay. tremendous mind for the business. He doesn't get the credit that he's definitely due. So, did you guys travel <clears throat> to Oroville together to join Pro Championship Wrestling, or how did that work? Yeah, basically, without going into too much old school detail. But yeah, we came up together. And uh, he kind of motivated me a little bit. You know, you're a big guy, Drake, and you're athletic. You, you should do it. And he was, you know, was there for me a little bit when I'd be icing my knees and, you know, putting super glue in my cuts and whatnot. You know what I mean? And that's a big deal, t uh, in my opinion, man, because I started in 2006, and I didn't really have anybody on my level yeah. that I could that could support me. I could support him back. But then in 2010, I met Mike Shoup, started training with him. We wrestled a lot together and then eventually debuted together and started wrestling a lot of shows together. And to have somebody that y is your friend and that is there for you and you, you hang out with and you motivate and you yeah. talk wrestling with, that's huge, man. Oh, yeah. Definitely helped me out. So what? So... You started training in pro championship wrestling, you said, at the PCW Work Farm in Yuba City. Was it 2000, 2001? Right in there, yeah. About 2001. And uh, for about a year. Oh, trained for about a year, and then you had your first match? Yeah. And it was just like getting thrown into a battle royal and stuff. And then... Where was it at? Uh, I can't remember. Someplace in Marysville. But <laughs> okay. I had... As soon as like I was done with training, I had kind of a falling out with PCW. So I, I had moved to Chico and was going to school and stuff. And they had done some weird angle. Maybe you've heard of it, where they said that the school had burnt down, right? I haven't heard this. No, okay. please elaborate. So there was this angle that they were trying to work online and stuff. And they were trying to fool everybody. And they said, uh, yeah, sorry, everybody. Our work farm has burnt down. And they had a picture of a building on fire and stuff. So... I call up like TOL and I was like, yo, what's going on with the school, right? And they're like, yeah, I guess it burnt down. And then, like, I couldn't get a hold of Schizo or Zach. And basically, they were faving me. They were kayfaving me, right? So, what I, I, I was so upset. Like, I drove down from Chico to the school and I was, and I got to the school and it was still there, right? So, I got pissed off. And because, like, I had, you know, I thought I was part of the boys. You, you know can't I mean? work a worker, man. Yeah, Come on. Go, rule number one. So I felt betrayed. So uh, I quit with PCW. And there was this idiot named Rob Wilds who was, like, oh, running in Marysville. <laughs> so I was like, hey, man, I'm no longer with PCW. I'd love to start working with you. Now, at the time, he was bringing in guys like Jimmy Snuka and Honky Tonk and. You know, but as a wrestler, he was the shits, man. He was terrible. But he was all psyched because he got a PCW guy to come into his promotion. You know what I mean? So he was like, King, I got one of Zach's boys. You know, they had like a little feud going. So I worked a couple matches with him. Nothing exciting. Nothing, you know, mind-blowing. Couple battle royals and like... When they would bring in a baby face and like heels would beat the shit out of them, like I was one of the unknown baby faces that would come in and kick out all the heels. You know what I mean? I had no gimmick or whatever. 
And then, like, I did, like, a skinhead gimmick for, like, two shows where shaved my head. I was basically the fat guy from American History X, you know what I mean? <laughs> Big Doc Martens and stuff. And uh, one of my best compliments I ever got as a wrestler is those. I was in a battle royal. I was, like, the biggest guy in it. And, uh, and, and Superfly Snooker comes up to me after the rumble, and he's like, You got a good forearm, brudda. And that was it. And then he walked away. You know what I mean? I was like, wow, he just complimented my forearm. You know what I mean? Which was like the simplest thing to do. You get a guy in the corner, you lift his chin up, bang, crack him in the chest. It looks devastating. You know, so I thought that was really cool. I did a show uh, uh, in, in some bullshit match, but Marty Jannetty was in the main event, which was really cool for me because I grew up in that era and would watch my brother who's eight years older than me was a huge fan of the rockers in the 80s and stuff so get being able to work a show with marty Janetti was tremendous two years later he had that tr uh, amazing match with kurt angle like on raw do you remember that yeah it was on smackdown yeah, yeah it was a, it was a great match and marty he was wearing a t-shirt you know what i mean but he gave angle uh, a run for his money it was amazing to watch. But those old school guys, man, you know, it didn't matter. They were just tremendous athletes and workers. So uh, so I do a couple shows for the UWA, right? And then um, uh, I, I move back down to Southern California, you know, and I start looking for work, and I meet Danny Ramirez, who was a referee for XPW. So he knows, you know, Pogo the Clown, Joe Applebomber, a couple other guys, and uh, they welcomed me with open arms, you know, and I rolled around with Joey Chaos and stuff, and they kind of gave me the pass, like, okay, he's a worker, we'll do something with him. So I, I do a couple shows as, like, they were trying to build me up as, like, a security guy, security guard, right, because I had a bouncing background and stuff, so I had, like, all the security outfit shit. So, uh... I'm doing a show in front of maybe 30 people. No one's paying attention. Everybody's hammered drunk because it's at like a Mexican bar, cantina <laughs> thing out in the middle of nowhere in Lancaster. So I'm doing this show. Now, uh, you know how easy it is for people to bullshit that they're in the wrestling business. They come to an independent show. They got a rolly bag and some boots they bought off high spots. And they can almost get in there. There's no fact-checking, you know what I mean? So that's what this guy did that I worked with. I don't remember his name. I, the only thing I remember about this guy is he told me he was trained by Brawlin' Bo Cooper, who does not have a good reputation as a trainer. You know I what actually, I, mean? I got to cut you off because I think they've tightened, the, the business has tightened up on a lot of that, I think, lately, I think now. I know Brawlin' Bo Cooper. I wrestled Brawlin' Bo Cooper, and I got nothing but great things to say about him. We had a, we had a really good time, and oh, I know sure. he is. He's a nice guy. I've met oh, him before, too. Uh, he's, he's a great guy, man. He's been around for about 20 years now, oh, and he, yeah. he is running a wrestling school. And oh, I've he? never, yeah, he is now, and, and I've never trained with him, so I, I couldn't tell you how he is as a trainer, but, uh, you know, as a worker and as a guy, man, nothing but great things to say so this guy that you're talking about though he claimed he was trained by brawling yeah Bob. and when you've been doing this business a long time you can tell right away how much experience has somebody but just by the lockup right oh yeah so we lock up and i realize that he ain't trained <laughs> Or it's shitty training. Not Wait, so you locked not up. To throw it back on Bo, but this was live during the show. This was during the show. Oh, like we had talked about <laughs> everything we were gonna do during the match. It was gonna be some whatever. We're just gonna bullshit a match, whatever. But we lock up, and I'm like, uh oh, this guy don't know what he's doing. So we're chain wrestling a little bit, and I'm putting myself in holds because he don't know what the hell he's doing, and I call a spot. Tackle drop down tackle. It's the easiest spot in the world. It's one of those spots that looks really cool and you learn it right away. You learn it in two months. So he's got me in a headlock. I back him into the rope, shoot him off. I cut him off just like I'm told. So I'm in the middle of the ring, right? Yeah. Giving him plenty of room to hit me with this tackle. Now, you know, when you're giving a shoulder tackle, you're not really giving him a shoulder tackle. You're tapping him with the shoulder. You take this big bump. It looks devastating. So what this guy did, instead of, you know, playing it up, <laughs> working with me, he runs me over. Oh, jeez. Right? Now, he had stepped on my foot, 
as he did it. So I took this big bump, and my ankle just exploded. Oh man, that was so. That was the match, right? Because I've seen. I remember this clip I had on a YouTube. Tape on it. Yeah. I remember the clip on YouTube. So this jabroni. I mean, do you want to mention his name? I can't even remember his name. So. <sighs> That's what happened to your ankle. That's the that's the clip on YouTube from all those years ago. Yeah. Totally wiped out your ankle, ended your wrestling career, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was no way. I broke it and dislocated it. Had to have surgery and stuff. What year was that? This was uh, 06. Okay. So, 06. So, man. So, how do you take that news, man? Does a doctor tell you, hey, bro, you can't be doing well, anything? they had told me. And, you know, I'm pretty stubborn where... I was like, well, let's see what happens. So I got through my rehab and stuff, and my ankle still is probably only like 80% of what like my it was, you know. But it's wrestling. You work around your injuries. There's guys with injuries that work, that have worked in pain for a long time. You work around it, you know. So I had no problem like doing the rehab and stuff. But uh, when I got now, during this time, I had accumulated this little degree in video production, so I'm already familiar with how to, you know, hold a camera and put it in an editing bay and create some crap, right? So uh, I moved back up to Northern California, and I move in with Bocce. Like, mm -hmm. I had known Bocce from years prior at Butte College, and uh, we had went to film school together and stuff. So he's also a wrestling fan, also somewhat like Rotten, where he's got tapes from everywhere he's you know like you'll bring up terry funk and he's like let me let me show you misawa from japan let me show you these guys you know so he had so he had a great mind for the business so we got the idea of let's go film some wrestling so i still had a friendship with zach we had kind of mended fences from the bullshit from when we were 20 you know and um he was like yeah well, i got a crew they're, you know, I pay these guys well. He paid, I don't remember what he paid them. He paid them really well. And they had these big, huge Canon cameras with big, fat lenses and this and that. And we saw their product and we were like, this is dog shit. You know, so we had a couple of mini DV cameras and a couple high eight cameras. And we were like, we'll go in there with three cameras. You know what I mean? And we go in and we edit the hell out of it. You know what I mean? And uh, Zach loved it. He was like, what am I paying this big crew for when I have Drake and Bocce who can do this stuff for nothing? And you know I remember I mean? this show. I believe it was April 2007. <clears throat> it was PCW Extreme Measures. The main event was MPT versus Scotty Aboot in a ladder match. Yeah. I was on security. So this was your first, uh, first kind of time. experimentation of filming. And you guys had this idea. You and Bocce said, we're going to film this and we're going to... We're gonna produce a show. I mean, what were the what were your initial ideas going into this? Well, so somebody was working SPW or something the next weekend, and they basically was like, "Hey, do you want to come film our stuff?" Right. So we did the same thing. We show up to PCW. This is our second show we filmed, and uh, now we've, I've, you know, I've got a decent reputation in, in the business. So we're invited to the booking meeting, and um. They're like, oh, yeah, by the way, the main event is a uh, barefoot thumbtack match, right? S completely different from <laughs> PCW. So we film that. We turn this into a tremendous match. We throw it online, and everybody loved it. So now Wasn't it intergender barefoot thumbtack match? Yeah, it was uh, Cassie Summers, Sir Samurai, Tim Thatcher, Dalton Frost. Yeah. In that, I think that was it. But they had... It was the craziest thing I've ever seen, yeah. you know what I mean? And they were tremendous, and uh, uh, I can't speak enough about how that match, you know, really kind of captivated us and, and really sent us off to the races. So for the next six months, uh, I'm still, I think I'm still taking some classes to, you know, build the degree up a little bit. And so uh, Butte College at the time, I don't know if they still do, they have a public access station. Yeah. So we were producing the show there. And then it got to the point months later that we're on the air in Reno, we're on the air in Oregon, and we're developing a fan base. And, uh, uh, yeah, it was just great. So that for six months, we're on the road. Every weekend, we're going to BTW and... Uh, you know, Brawl at yeah. the time, and uh, Fog City Wrestling, and, 
you know. I got in the car with you guys and went to brawl with you one time. Yeah. <laughs> no, and the thing was too, Drake, I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm like a year in, I'm 19 years old, I'm like, wow, you know, this is a big deal. Like, yeah. like I, I'm watching, you know, my trainers and, and my, um, you know, fellow wrestlers and stuff on television at home. I'm like, this is a big yeah. deal. So what you did, man, for everybody, I mean, it was a big deal, you and Tom, and I mean, that was huge. And um, and I want to thank you for that, man. I know a lot of guys have, th have thanked you and, and you know, well-deserved. So how long did you do that for? Uh, I think like two years. I was going strong with Bocce, something like that. And uh, we had, we were living, we were sharing a studio apartment, right? I remember. He was in the <laughs> living room. I'm in the bedroom. He's got an editing bay in the living room, and I have a computer uh, in the, my bedroom. So that ended up like, as soon as he started like banging a girl... Then it became like a problem, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it was like whoever's gonna start getting pussy first is gonna mess up the relationship. So he fell in love because he started bodybuilding and like girls started like chasing him, you know what I mean? So he got a hot girl and that became his world. So I moved in with uh, Rick Luxury. So oh yes, <laughs> uh, at this amazing wrestling house <laughs> where this house was like where rick grew up but his parents had gotten divorced and just left him the house now this is during the housing crisis so like everybody was living rent free at that time like no one gave a shit so we had the wrestling ring in the backyard we had a 20-year marriage uh, breakdown of trash in the backyard. I'm sure you remember this. You and if you at the time, I remember if you Google image the house, you could see the trash pile from space. Wow. You know what I mean? So I was. It was a great house and uh, hardwood deck. Uh, hardwood deck too. Uh, yeah. When you take a high school boy bump out on that deck out there, it hurts. <laughs> I'll tell you. No, Drake. Let, let's get into it, man. Because we had some amazing parties oh, over yeah. there. I don't want to incriminate anyone, but I mean, the True TV stuff is out there. You were there that night, oh, yeah. but we had many more, uh, many more parties over there. What were some of the most memorable experiences at Rick oh, Luxury's man. house yeah. living there? Uh, the, definitely the beer brawls. We did a couple shows, just like we all got hammered. We we built like an elaborate beer bong, and hung it on the turnbuckle like pole. So we would, uh, yeah, we just did, co like, we just set up a show, and we did commentary, live commentary and shit. But it was a show for the boys, though. Like, we yeah. didn't charge admission. We didn't bring fans in. For yeah. the most part, it was everybody in the business, every friends and family. Little friends. Yeah. You know, ki not kids, but, like, it was, you know, everybody was, was smoking weed. It was, it was basically the brainchild of what hood slam became absolutely you know what i mean absolutely. and they gave me a lot of credit they did this somebody did a great documentary on hood slam a while ago and they paid a lot of tribute to uh beer to brawl, beer brawl yeah. and they put me in it and i thought that was really classy for those guys to do you know um they should have put they, me in it damn it come on yeah, true tv baby yeah. <laughs> it was definitely like a really fun time man like we every weekend we were on the road like rick is, a, is at the time was working everywhere and sometimes would have three four shows in a weekend so i was living with him and uh wasn't filming as much as uh as i would have liked you know bocce and i had kind of parted ways and he had started doing more film stuff and he's killing it now by the way oh, yeah. um and also dabbling in comedy by the way He's not oh, stand up, is he? He's not as funny as me, but he's dabbling. <laughs> you know, he's doing pretty well. But um, yeah, I was doing that for a while, and uh, doing videos with the Suburban Commandos and stuff. Where because they were taking a lot of heat from different companies and stuff, so we were making these videos to kind of uh, rib people back. So people like would would piss them off, and oh, let's make a video talking shit about this guy. And let's make a video talking shit about this guy. And people were so eager to see the next video. Oh shit, Commandos dropped another video, man. You know what I mean? And uh, not, I mean, it was a great. We, I basically had a studio in Rick's house yeah. of all these flyers and stuff. And the, I was having the boys cut promos, and I just edited the shit out of them and it was really fun and interesting you know those commando ones man the ye awards the christmas the special yeah, oh those were great. great those were fantastic <laughs> um who were some of the guys that you noticed i mean here you are 2008 2009 you know living with rick and you're seeing all this talent man i mean who are some of the guys that are just standing out to you like this guy needs a contract oh yeah uh jody christopherson i mean he did get a contract 
uh, and he did really well. Brian Cage, another guy that's killing it right now. Um, but I always, my favorite three of that time, and I was just telling you before we started, was Rick Luxury, Adam Thornstow, and um, <laughs> who's the other guy? I'm trying to blank. Rick Luxury, Adam Thornstow, Zachary. Oh, that Mr. guy. Mr. Primetime. Like, those three guys right there, man, uh, I, one of them should have got a contract. I think they're all equally, like, great at what they do. You know, um, well, but they'll surprise the hell out of you any day of the week. You know what I mean? Um, Virgil Flynn, uh, I, I think if he was two inches taller and 20 pounds heavier, would be the king of wrestling right now. He's amazing. Um, Chupacabra, you know, uh, a f very good friend of mine. Like, that guy's a tremendous athlete. Uh, doesn't get the credit he's due. Uh, Dylan Drake, another guy I thought was great. Scotty Boot, like, he didn't do anything in the wrestling business and i think he's the greatest thing i've ever seen like <laughs> you know what i mean like he, the greatest athlete i've ever seen yeah. and he got it man because he was trained the hard way the old school way by yeah, schizo so he got it you know what i mean yeah it's a shame but you know what scotty did what he wanted to do and he's yeah. uh he's living in oregon right now man he's, he's loving living, life he's loving, he's loving just, it i just talked to him about three or four months ago and he's loving it uh, he's also uh he's been debating on getting into comedy too and with that guy's work ethic and how natural he just takes to whatever he's got his mind on, I think he'll be tremendous. Like Definitely. he called me up wanting to uh, talk comedy and give, you know, I wanted some advice about it and stuff. And I was like, you're going to be fine because uh, the wrestling mentality focused on comedy is a dangerous combination, man. When you outwork people and stuff and you show up early and you leave late and you shake everybody's hand and do what you're taught in the wrestling business, like that's. I can honestly say what I've learned in wrestling has helped me in my comedy career exponentially just because of the work ethic and, you know, doing, you know, I have no, like, I have a great room here tonight. Yeah. This is tremendous. Like, I got a beautiful bathroom in there. Like, it's a big ass tub and shit. But if they would have gave me a cot, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't need a TV or whatever. If they would have given me a cot and a fucking lamp. I would have been fine. They could have gave me a broom closet, and I'd have been like, "Cool, thanks, you guys, so much." Yeah. You know, going back to what you said, Drake, and closing out this <clears throat> wrestling chapter in your life because I do want to talk about your comedy. But I mean, like you said, man, what you learned in wrestling is it helped you in your comedy. I feel like what I learned in wrestling helped me in life, man. Like I don't know where I would have been in life, in life, what I would have done with my life if I if I didn't have you know Zach and Pro Championship Wrestling kind of teaching me respect, teaching me yeah. how to be a man. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but yeah, let's talk about your comedy, Drake. What, what finally inspired you to get up there and grab a mic? Well, uh, a lot of it. The first initiation of it was traveling with the boys, you know, piling five or six guys in a car and going to a show. And you're in a car for five, six hours, right? And I was always cracking them up, you know. I would rip them apart on the way to the show, and then on the way home when everybody's beat up, you know, I was cracking everybody up. And you were been on some of those Absolutely. road trips. Yeah. And for years, the boys were like, dude, you're funny. You should be a comedian. And I'd say, yeah, I'm not into that, man. I'll be in the wrestling business till the day I die, <laughs> you know. But um, there was a, a three- or four-month period where things just started kind of pissing me off about the wrestling business. From the WWE to the independent scene, I just wasn't liking what I was seeing. And I was maturing a little bit, you know. And I couldn't be a wrestler. I started getting tired of seeing my friends either not make it or get hurt. You know what I mean? Or get hooked on pills or whatever. You know what I mean? So I kind of grew out of it and I got tired of it. So um, it took me about six months to work up the nerve to do an open mic. You know what I mean? So How'd it go that first night? The first night, it was great. You know, um, it was right by my house. And uh, I had been going there a couple months. And this one night, it was just me and like four comics. And I'm cracking them up. And... I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I was like, I'm way funnier than these guys. So it's it was a slow night. There's no one in there except comics and me. And they're like, Drake, it's your turn. And I was like, no, I'm not ready yet. And they're like, just do it. No one's here except us. You're already funny as hell. So I did two sets my first night and loved it, you know. So that was like a, 
slower open mic. Now the big open mic in Reno is called Third Street Bar. It's every Wednesday. It's been there for years. That's the one where you cut your teeth on. So uh, I finally worked up the nerve, put my name on the list, introduced myself to the to the guy. You know what I mean? Shook his hand, and whatnot. Now the way they do that this open mic is uh, you do five minutes and then it's a competition. So you if you win you do 15 the next week right i knew i didn't i want to do 15 i wasn't even prepared for that at all right so i had brought a bunch of the boys out i had brought the reno guys out big uh paulo zadora chupacabra was there a couple other guys and uh they ended up like clapping and cheering for me at the end so i won you know and i was like <laughs> you motherfuckers why did you do that i don't want to do 15 i'm scared to hell so uh after bombing for 15 minutes the next week uh somebody handed me 20 bucks you know for winning and i was like oh my god you can get paid doing this you know and that just it was a light switch for me you know what i mean because i was taught in the wrestling business if you can get some money get your money man you're an entertainer and it just totally shifted so then uh i didn't have the wrestling business anymore so i started focusing on comedy so i started studying reading books and learning the process of how to build a set you know i started figuring out who books this room who books that room there's one comedy club in reno at the time and that was catch rising star mm -hmm. and catch rising star is like you know madison square garden you know what i mean everybody knows catch rising star eddie murphy started there you know, uh, uh, Richard Belzer, like these big name comics came out of Catch Rising Star, you know. So <clears throat> they got a branch, a franchise in Reno, you know what I mean? So that was my goal. I was like, I want to get there sometime. So uh, I, it, it was a slow, relatively easy process, though. And a lot of my success was just meeting the right people, being respectful, shaking their hands, you know. So uh, a year into my career, uh the booker who's now a good friend of mine dave saw me at third street and was like hey man you want to come by and do five minutes or something at laugh at catch rising star and inside i was like oh my god that's this is awesome i'm going to a comedy club so then i get there and dave's not feeling that well and he's like hey man i'm not really feeling it you think you can go 15 you know what i mean in a legit comedy club right Damn. i'm not prepared for that <laughs> at all so I, i'm but of course same thing in the wrestling business you just fake it until you make it, man. You you do what you're asked. So I go out and I tank, but you know I I stayed up there for enough time. I did my time. You know what I mean. So afterwards, he was like, "Yeah, you know, you you did okay, man. You need more jokes, right?" <laughs> and I was like, "What are you talking about? I was up there for 15 minutes." You know, I didn't understood what that mean that meant until later. You know, where I really learned how to structure a joke and have a setup and then a punchline, this and that, learn how to craft a bit. So it was tremendous advice that I got from him. And how uh, soon was this, man? Because you did your year. open mic a year in well, at, about at a comedy club, at a year in. At about seven months is when I did my first spot. And then just from befriending this guy, uh, he gets tired of the business and wants to pass the job on to me. So I'm a year in. And now I'm managing a comedy club. Six nights a week, I'm working with a different headliner from all over the country. And that's how it really shifted it. You know, it's how you get really good really fast. Who were some of the guys, maybe some headliners or maybe some local guys that really uh, you picked their brain and you learned a lot from, uh, you know, starting out? Wayne Walsh is the guy that he booked the Third Street Bar and a uh, local comic, but I've been doing it for seven, eight years. And uh, he really, we started a podcast together, a comedy podcast. And uh, he really kind of helped me like, oh, you know, you should watch this guy or watch Stan Hope or watch Bill Hicks. And really turned me on to these guys and uh, really kind of made me focus on what sets look like here's a five minute set here's a 10 minute set here's a 20 minute feature here's a 30 minute feature here's a headline you know what i mean so he really kind of he elevated it to the business part of it like this booker is going to ask you to do this howie at the improv in tahoe is going to want this seven minutes and you know and then um 
Dave Mancarelli and Rick D'Elia were the two guys that uh, they're both like veterans of Reno. You know, D'Elia's all over the place now, but Dave's still there. He's on the air uh, on radio right now. Um, Dave got me in a catch rising star, but when I was three months in, Rick D'Elia gave me a spot at Sammy's showroom at Harrah's in Reno, which Sammy's showroom is named after Sammy Davis Jr. It's a serious showroom at Harrah's. Bill Cosby's played there a million times. Uh, everybody that was a known act in the 60s, 70s, and 80s would come through Sammy's showroom. So that was a big deal. Um, and it was cool because D'Elia treated me like a wrestler almost. So I, I came highly recommended in the local scene. Three months in, uh, I'm backstage, about to go on, and Rick says, Hey, man, I don't know who the fuck you are, so if you suck, you are never coming back, <laughs> right? No pressure. Nah, you no know, pressure <laughs> at all. But that's how it kind of is in the wrestling business. It's real yeah. straight up. If you hurt this guy, you're done. We don't know who you are, you know? So I went out, and I did okay, you know? But... Uh, but me being respectful and nice got me to keep doing Harris. You know what I mean? So those three guys right there really kind of got the ball rolling for me. Nice, you know? man. Nice. Yeah, no, I remember you talk about Wayne Walsh. I remember watching you guys on like a live webcam show or mm -hmm. something. Funny guy, man. So, um, wow, Drake. So you started coming in 2011? Something like that, yeah. 2011, here it is, 2016, five years into the comedy business. Like you said, you just performed here at Gold Country Casino um, with... Uh Huck Flynn. With Huck Flynn, and he was real funny as well. And it was a, it was a great show, man. You're, I mean, this is my first time seeing you live. Yeah. What were some of your more memorable shows over these last five years? Yeah, I've uh, I've worked with a couple names you know, over the last couple of years. I got to open up for Josh Blue, who uh, who was on Last Comic Standing. He's the guy that's uh, paraplegic, I think paraplegic. No, he's got cerebral palsy. Excuse me. Uh, he was tremendous. Packed house. I freaking crushed it. Not to toot my own horn, but he had an easy job because, you know, I've been doing the same uh, comedy club at a casino for so long. Like, that's my crowd. So, uh, Josh Blue was fun to work with. Uh, I just got to work with uh, Jamie Kennedy. Oh, nice. You know, he was a great guy. Uh, he's been hinting at taking me on the road, but, you know, who knows what's going to happen with that. Um, Tom Rhodes, who's been... In the business 20 years in 25 years something like that he had a show on uh mtv vh1 nice dude um i got to meet uh andrew dice clay not too long ago in december i was at the tropicana in vegas and uh we didn't work together but he did the second shows on the first show right so it was cool we got to hang out backstage and do karaoke and they just got in this uh kegerator down there so i was getting all drunk and <laughs> it was just cool to hang out with andrew dice clay man like i was a huge fan of dice in the late 80s early 90s and the adventures of ford fairlang is one of my favorite movies of all time so i was trying to play it cool and not mark out you know what i mean <laughs> that was definitely a, a, a like a big guy that i really admired and i got to work with um, who else have I worked with? Uh, hmm. Why are you, why are you contemplating Bobby that, Drake? Bobby Collins. Okay. Bobby Collins, he won uh, Star Search back in the day. He's not really known anymore, but he was a great veteran to work with as well. All right. Well, what were we going to say? Well, I was going to say, man, so what about as far as travel? Like, where has this comedy world brought you as far as, uh, you know, traveling? You said Vegas, you're here in Oroville, Reno. I mean, where else have, what are some of the craziest places it's taken you? So, in the business, we call triple gigs. Triple gigs are uh, a, a series of rooms that are booked by a guy named David Tribble, right? Now, Tribble's been around for 35, 40 years, he's, but he's booked... You know, and every big name guy has probably done at least one triple gig, right? And uh, they're not amazing gigs, but they're road gigs, and they they used to pay pretty well back in the day during the comedy boom of the '80s and '90s. And now they're just kind of scattered around Thursday nights, Friday nights. You know what I mean? Can't really make a lot of money on them anymore. But I've done a lot of those. You know, up in Washington. Uh, Grants Pass, Oregon, Boise, Idaho. Wow. You know, uh, one of them was up in frickin' Plentywood, Montana or something. <laughs> and it was so close to Canada that it was easier to get uh, 
cell phone signal from Canada than it was the United States. You know what I mean? So that was a real crappy show. Um, Winnemucca, Nevada, uh, Bay Area. Yeah, I'm getting all over the place, man. I just did a gig in uh, in Burbank at the Flappers Comedy Club with Joey Medina. That was really fun. Um, just work with Willie Barsena, who's got Netflix specials right now. And um, I have a uh, small part in a movie that Rick D'Elia produced. It's called Rob Sampson, the One Minute Comic. And it's about, it's a like mockumentary, right? And it's about this guy named Rob Sampson who uh, ha his gimmick was like he would kill for one minute. He would just destroy for one minute and then get off the stage <laughs> and blow everybody away. So, like, there's some big-name comics in this movie, and I have a small part in it, right? Like, Bill Burr's in it, uh, uh, Nick Swartzen, nice. you know, Dane Cook. Like, there's going to be some pretty big names. Gilbert Gottfried, like... When's this thing coming out? Where can people find it? Uh, it's going to be on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon, something like that. So and what's he, the name he, of it? It's called Rob Sampson, the One Minute Comic. Or One Minute Comic, The Legend of Rob Sampson, something like that. And uh, so I got interviewed in it. So that's going to be a nice credit for me. Oh, know? yeah, man. Well, sh well, shit, Drake. There's a, there's a cuss word for you. Uh, <laughs> I'm throwing it out there. Uh, and I'll tell you what, man. I, I, I said it, uh, or you said it a couple years ago. You said uh, you're going to see me on Comedy Central here in the next, uh, very soon, in the next couple years, you know. And I think that's going to happen, man. I think that's going to happen. I mean, what's your ultimate goal here? Where do you, where do you uh, see yourself going? Where do you want to go? And uh, what's next? You know, I don't have like a total goal other than I don't like punching a time clock, man. I don't like having a job with a boss. So if I can get to the point where I'm paying all my bills and I'm able to buy a house or buy a house for my parents, you know, with the uh, dick jokes, like that's <laughs> where I'm going, man. The thing with comedy, though, is in order to get booked in a lot of these clubs, they want you to have a credit from something that doesn't have anything to do with stand-up comedy, you know what I mean? So you gotta have like a sitcom or some type of credit. So these next couple of years, I'm kind of, I, mean, I don't want to say years, but the next phase of my career is I'm about to move to Los Angeles and try and get an agent and some credits and stuff. And, you know, I'm starting all over. I'm taking my five years of a rapid comedy career and going down there and couch hopping and hanging out at the comedy store and the Laugh Factory and the improvs and stuff and taking that work ethic that I've uh, garnered from the wrestling business and just uh, seeing what happens, man. So I'm going to get an agent and go auditions and this stuff. And so we'll see what happens, man. It's going to be exciting. Yeah, it's the reason you're going to be successful, Drake, because <clears throat> you took everything in wrestling that you had going on and you said, you know what, I'm going to move to Reno and I'm going to pursue comedy. And you have everything going on these last couple of years, all these things you're doing, all these connections you've made, and you're like, well, now I'm going to... You know, I'm gonna move to a whole different location and start all over again. I mean, that's a that's admirable, man, and that's uh, that's the key to success, right there, Drake. Where can uh, people find more out about Drake Nelson? Uh, I got a couple uh, different things on social media: DrakeNelsonComedy.com. I'm a video gamer too, Mitch. So I have a Twitch channel, okay. so where I play video games, and you can watch me goof off and murder 15 year olds online. <laughs> and uh, my Twitch channel is uh, Twitch.tv/DrakeComic. Now, you're not going to actually murder 15-year-olds, but in a game sense. In I game. just want to make that clear. You're not a murderer of, you know, minors. What I like to do, like, uh, I'll give you an example of the things I do to entertain myself when I'm streaming, is I like to mess with my teammates sometimes. So, like, on Call of Duty, for example, you can get a thing called a riot shield, right? So I like to back up one of my teammates into a corner, right? And so they can't move. And you can hear him. And he's like, hey, man, what are you trying? What are you doing, dude? I can't move. And then I go, shh. It'll be over soon. You know, I kind of mess with them, you know. So that's the kind of entertaining crap I do online. There you go. <laughs> and uh, Twitter, Facebook. Yeah, follow me on Twitter, at Cannibal Drake. Drake Nelson on Facebook. And uh, I'm starting to do more Instagram stuff. Uh, I might do a, like a funny picture we were talking about tonight where I get in the bathtub and uh, put it on Instagram. So I work around naked women, so I post a lot of inappropriate stuff on Instagram. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to check that out. Uh, Drake Nelson, man, it's great to see you. It's been years. It's, uh, it's awesome. It's awesome to see you. It's awesome to talk to you, man. And, My pleasure, uh, brother. Thank you for coming on the show.
Thanks, man. I really appreciate it, man. Good luck to you and your career, too, brother. Thank you, Drake. Good times right there with my buddy, uh, Drake Nelson, a guy that I love and a guy that I can definitely see making it big here very shortly, guys. Keep your eye out for Drake Nelson. And yeah, that's going to do it this week. Uh, appreciate everybody for listening, uh, for staying connected on the social media at Heartbreaker MV, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. Follow me, will ya? And then, of course, you know, youtube.com slash the Mitch Valentine. Every episode of Mitch Please and so much more. I've got pro wrestling matches, pro wrestling promos. I've got freestyle raps. I've got all kinds of crap. So you need to check that out. And, of course, facebook.com slash Mitch Please Podcast will keep you updated as well with this show. Uh, next week, we're going to have a great show. I'm not going to reveal my guest yet because there are some things in the works here, guys. I'm going to be getting some more wrestlers. I'm going to be getting some more comedians. I want want to get some musicians i i might even have some other stuff going on i mean what do you guys want to hear let me know hit me up on the facebook hit me up on the twitter hit me up on the uh you know the yahoo mail hit me up on the uh, hit me up on the old yahoo mail i think i'm the only guy that actually still has yahoo mail but uh, that's another story for another day right now we're gonna end the show and we're gonna kick it over to drake nelson live doing his thing thank you guys very much how are we doing everybody Here, there's the uh, Caucasian mating call. Woo! <laughs> we lost some fun tonight. Woo! My nipples get hard when I hear that stuff. So let's, don't do it anymore. It'll be an awkward show. We're doing this. I'm in a really good mood today, guys. I was walking around downtown today. This homeless guy asked me for money. And uh, of course, I didn't give him any, but I was like, hey, man, thank you so much for assuming I got some. <laughs> Must be doing something, right? Yeah. I usually do this thing where I tell them, oh, I'm really sorry, I don't have any change, all I have is my credit card, and uh, I tried that a couple weeks ago when I was down in Los Angeles, and this guy was like, oh, don't worry about that, you can slide it on my iPhone. <laughs> like, homeless people are coming into the future now, I don't know. They are not letting technology stop me. Man, Reno, is this a weird town or what? Holy shit. <laughs> Have you guys walked around this place? You see some weird stuff. I was walking around about a half hour ago, saw a woman breastfeeding at a slot machine. I saw her too! You see her too? What kind of winning streak are you on, lady? Like, I know it's gonna mess that kid up later on in life, you know? Like, every time he hears bells and whistles and shit. He's gonna be like, man, I gotta drink some milk. <laughs> I gotta put a tip in my mouth. I don't know. <laughs> this place is weird, man. I caught a guy today who couldn't figure out how the uh, faucet works in the bathroom. Like, there's no handles in there, you know? He's looking at me all confused, like, I need to help him out. I'm like, oh, here's what you do, man. You gotta let that guy behind the glass know you need some water. <laughs> He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, there's a code here in Reno. You gotta knock on the glass three times. Let me show you. Water shoots out and he's like, oh my god! The guy showed him a magic trick. Who knows how long he was standing there. If you see somebody in the bathroom confused, help them out with that, because they fall for it every freaking time. I saw something the other day on that freaked me out, I'll never forget. I saw somebody in a motorized wheelchair towing three other guys <laughs> in regular wheelchairs. Like, where are these people going, you know? How did they even meet? That's what I want to know. Hey, you guys uh, need a lift? <laughs> Have a car, man. Ah, just hold on to the back. We'll get there together. I think I'm looking at the Reno bobsled team or something, I don't know. Training for the Olympics, I don't know. I don't know if you guys noticed, uh, I'm getting pretty fat. It's not like a joke or anything. Like, this happened out of nowhere, too. Like, I used to have like, a really buff body, you know? 
Now I have what you call a buffet body. It's a little different. Okay, I can't see my genitals anymore. They're just, they're just gone. Last time I saw was when my girlfriend texted them to me. That was nice. At least I hope they were mine. I hope she's not like seeing multiple fat guys. And I'm having like these weird like fat guy problems, you know? Like, uh, I'll give an example. If I'm holding something and I drop it, it's gotta be really important for me to pick up. <laughs> yep, that's gonna stay down there forever. Don't need that anymore. I'm so fat, like I this year uh, entered my first eating contest. Like you locals know we got the rib cook off every year, right? I got to be at this eating contest. And uh, I have no business being in an eating contest other than I look like I've been training my whole life for an eating contest, you know? All I did was send them my picture and they're like, oh yeah, he'll do fine. <laughs> now I'm a very competitive fat guy, right? Now the world record for rib meat used to be 9.8 pounds. It's a lot, right? I didn't know how to gauge 9.5 pounds or whatever it was, but my friend just had a baby. So I'm like, hey man, can I hold your baby? So I'm holding it, and I'm like, you know what? I think I can do this. <laughs> it got a little awkward when I started dipping his little foot in barbecue sauce. You know? I'm like, what are you doing to my son? I'm like, I'm training, leave me alone. Hey, you guys have been a great crowd. My name is Drake Nelson. Enjoy the rest of the show. Drake Nelson. <laughs>